Good morning. Can't hear you through your mask. Good morning. What a beautiful day we've got ahead of us, and a whole week too, I think. Let's get on our feet, and if you feel so moved, raise your hands, put your hands together, and let's praise the Lord. something exciting next week. Everybody needs a little excitement right now, right? Okay, so we can have 45 people here live and in person next Sunday for our night of worship. If you want to come for that, call the church office, make your reservation. If you don't get in, because tickets are limited, um, you can still watch on Facebook Live next Sunday at 6. So we all love our worship team and we want to hear them come together just have a night of worship together as a congregation. And now, if you'll bow your heads and let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the changing of seasons, Lord. We thank you that we are able to gather again in this place and lift up your name together, Father. We thank you for the fellowship this provides. We thank you that we are one in Christ, Lord, and that you are providing unity among us. I ask, Father, that you'd help keep us mindful that you are in control and that as these next few weeks likely become ever more divided, Lord, that we would be able to trust that your will will be done and we will stand together as the body of Christ and show other people love and 
draw them and lead them into you, Father. Give us the strength to do that. Put peace in our hearts. Help us to rely on you. And we thank you again for the privilege of being able to come together and lift up the name of the Most High God. Thank you, Father. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
Well, praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful that it's his breath in our lungs because his breath has been fogging my glasses instead of mine. But um, give him praise anyway. Our scripture lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. And I know you just got seated, but you know, it's kind of nice to stand in the presence of the Word of God. So would you do that? It says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a, de a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is God's word for God's people. You can be seated. Sometimes it takes a mountain Sometimes it troubles sea Sometimes it takes a desert To get a hold Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, Jesus. I thought I could control whatever life could throw.
Boy, the singing around here is good, isn't it? I've always said that I can preach better when the singing's good. And uh, I've, there's been a freedom in this church. I want to tell you, now, this is something that when preachers talk about preaching in churches, when they say there's a freedom in the church, that means you can feel the Holy Spirit. And I can feel the Holy Spirit in this room. And I'm so thankful for you and for the part you play in that because I believe that that happens when people pray. And I thank you for the prayers that you give for me, for your praise team, and for the people of your church and your community. I do believe you're a praying church. And uh, I have been in churches that weren't. <laughs> I can tell there's a difference. But uh, thank, thank you for that. And if you're not praying Start now. There's time. Start now. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment when we get to hear your word. And we pray, Lord, that in these moments you would hide me behind your cross. Let me become lesser, that you might become greater, that we might know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you've been in this room and have spoken to our hearts. These things we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'm thankful for good scripture lessons that help us understand what's going on. And as Matthew was writing in today's scripture lesson, he was writing about one of these events that's been been happening as you go through Matthew's gospel, you see that there's kind of a, an effort brewing from the beginning by those who are in charge to try to trip Jesus up. It happened with the very highest people in government at the beginning of Jesus' life. That's Herod, 
who was king over the land, who as soon as he heard that there was a group of people coming to worship Jesus, he got them to come to his house first, and he struck a deal with them. When you find the child, you come back and tell me so I can go and worship him. And you knew that was a lie, didn't you? He had no intention of worshiping Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. And there were other incidents where things happened, and then Matthew is quick to tell us how the Pharisees felt about it and what was going on, and there was a conspiracy. Anybody know that there's such things as conspiracies? There was a conspiracy by the people in charge to bring Jesus down. That conspiracy was going on in today's text. Pharisees get together and uh, decide that they're going to try to trap Jesus. They've tried every way in the world to do something to see if he would trip over his own words, to see if something would happen. And here they are plotting to trap him. And so they ask him this thing about, well, teacher, we know that you're sincere and you teach the way of God in accordance with truth. See, they're pouring it on, aren't they? You ever done that to somebody? And you show deference to no one. You, regard, you do not regard people with partiality. So tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to obey the law? That's what they ask. They say it this way, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? <laughs> well, Caesar's the head of state, the head of the empire. It's Caesar who made the law that said you need to pay taxes to Caesar. So they're asking, is it lawful to obey the law? Now, that's about the dumbest thing I ever heard. Is it, is it lawful to be lawful? Only Jesus wasn't scratching his head. He knew exactly what they were doing. He saw through everything that they were trying to do. And he even said to them, why are you trying to trap me? And then he asked, whose image is on the coin? And they said, the emperor's, in King James it says Caesar's. And Jesus said, well, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But give God what belongs to God. And when we think about this text, there's things that are going on. The Pharisees are mad. That's one reason there's a group of Pharisees, they're they're mad because there's this situation going on in their country where they are uh, an occupied territory, much like the occupied territory that's over there today. And what's going on is the Roman Empire has come in and they have established control over the entire place. They're the ones that set up Herod as king, as a puppet, and Herod has all kinds of power as long as he does what Rome wants him to do. And so they even changed the coinage because Israel had its own coinage. They used the shekel. And that's how they dealt with things with themselves. But if you, had, if you bought something at a public market you would have to be sure that you paid in Roman coins. That's why they had money changers at the temple because to go to the temple, it would have been profane to take money and put in the offering at the temple that was Roman. So you had to change your Roman currency to shekels. Remember that day that Jesus got mad and tore through the temple and turned over the money changers' tables. 
See, Scripture has this thing that they're talking to us about money. And if you want to really see a church dry up quick, let the preacher start preaching about money. <laughs> and they're looking for the exits already. But it does take money, doesn't it, to make things happen in this world? So there's a part of our lives that we're in our spiritual lives, we know that we have to give a portion of our money to God's kingdom. And I'm thankful to tell you that even though I'm going to tell you something else in a minute, what God requires of us is only 10%. Did you know the government's tax rate is higher than that? No. And... Uh, you know, I've heard this played out in terms of how much you tip at a restaurant. Uh, do you know that restaurant wait staff tell us that church-going Christians are some of the worst people to serve? Because they'll get notes on Sundays when they're really crowded. And just, just watch the wait staff, how overworked they are on Sundays. And they sometimes get nothing. And sometimes they'll, they might get 10% and a note that says, I only give 10% to God, why should I give you any more? <laughs> That's not nice, is it? Just If you're going to do that, just don't leave the note. <laughs> but um, we have this thing with you know, money. Money is an important part of our lives. And it can make or break us spiritually how we handle it. Have you ever known people who hoarded money? Got news for them. Can't take it with you when you leave this life. So it's important that we figure out a way to use it appropriately with our values so that we do the things that please God with it. I think that's part of what Jesus was saying, but he was also saying, you know, if you're mad about paying Caesar money because he's the Roman emperor and you don't like the Roman empire having control over you, go ahead and give your Roman coinage to Caesar, but give to God what's God's. And he's not talking about shekels. Now, here's where it gets real. Everything belongs to God. Mm, what? Have you ever heard that? Do you know that everything we have belongs to God? Do you know every breath that you have taken in your life was a gift from God? Do you know that everything that is in your life is a gift? All of our life belongs to God. Jesus says, give the emperor what's his, but give God's, God what is his. If it all belongs to God, then God has a prior claim on it all. And that would change the way we live our lives. Because now we have to prioritize in terms of how will we please God with the things that we have. When I was growing up, I was not the uh, wealthiest person. I came from a family that uh, worked hard for what we had, but we didn't have a whole lot. And when my dad died when I was 16 years old, there was some real questions about how we were going to make it. And my mother counted the days until I'd be out of the house. <laughs> so there would be one less mouth to feed. And um, God, God helped us with that. He, he helped us make it through. 
But I remember when it came time for me to have an automobile, I had worked in the summers as a summer youth worker at a church, and those are not high-paid positions. But I saved everything I could save after I spent out a lot on my kids. I saved everything I could save, and I, <laughs> I went to the car lot to buy a vehicle without a job and with a very small down payment and without any idea that I was going to be able to make the payments. <laughs> you know, they sold me a car. <laughs> Sometimes they're pretty hungry. They sold me a car. It was not a new car. In fact, it was about mm, six, seven years old. It was a 1980 Dodge Omni. Little little car. It worked for a couple months. And um, before I totaled it, I actually had uh, had some some uh, mechanical problems I was working on, and I I just got them fixed before Friday the 13th came, and someone hit me in the back, which made it their fault, and it totaled it. But um, I remember when I bought the car, I knew that I really didn't have a lot of reason to think I could pay for that thing. But I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, help me use this car to your glory. And if there's any way I can serve you through this, help me to do that. I know other people that different times of their lives, the things that they're able to get and have are things that they would then turn over to the Lord. When we do that, it changes how we think about it. There's this thing we do as Methodists. I don't know if you've ever done this or not, but one of the things that... Uh, people can't understand about us is that when we have a baby in the Methodist church, we come to the altar and we baptize it. Seems out of sequence to some people. There, there's, this, there's this strong thing in our culture called believer's baptism. They believe you've got to have faith before you have it, but Methodists have this strong reliance upon the concept of grace that we believe God's grace begins working in your life even before you know who God is or that there is a God. And a family that loves their child will bring their child to the altar to be baptized as a way of recognizing that God's grace is at work in their life already. And there's a moment in that service that means an awful lot more than you think it does when you look at it. It's that moment when the parent gives their child over to the preacher. It's a simple thing. The preacher's going to hold the baby when they baptize the child. We're going to take care of it for that moment. We're going to love it. We're going to do it. We're going to hold it carefully. We've been, we've, been, we've been trained how to do that. I've seen some videos on Facebook from some of these Eastern Orthodox priests that take the baby and dunk it three times. We don't do that. <laughs> now, if they were teenagers, we might do that. But, I, but, <laughs> but it's that moment when the parent gives that child up. You don't think that that's a big deal. But what's happening in that moment symbolically is that this child, which these parents have made which is a miracle in and of itself. This child is given not just to the minister to hold, but to God to love. A lot of times, I haven't had a chance to baptize the baby here yet, but a lot of times after the baptism takes place, Pray that baby up and down the aisle, look at the church and say to y'all, 
welcome your new little brother, your new little sister into the faith. Because as a congregation, we all bear responsibility for that child to witness the love of Jesus Christ to him or her throughout their life so that they will get to that moment where that baptism becomes believer's baptism for them when they accept Jesus for themselves. But that's a beautiful moment when those parents give that baby up to God. I usually make a point of saying to the family when I give it back that you gave him up to God and God gives him back now to you. To make a saint out of him or her. That's the way God works. When Jesus said, give God what is God's, we need to give our whole lives to God. I'm a lover of history. I love to read history. And I, when I was a student minister in a church in Hendersonville, North Carolina, the summer before I went into seminary, I, uh, I had the opportunity to read a journal that the pastor of that church owned that belonged to his grandfather who was a minister in Holston Conference who rode on horseback circuits all over this conference and preached so hard that at one time he lost his voice <laughs> and had to quit preaching for a few years. But he had this thing that he did. There was two, two types of dedication that he wrote about in his journal. One was that he made a practice of reading the Bible from cover to cover within a year's time. And one year he decided to read the Bible from cover to cover on his knees. I thought, wow, I can't be on my knees longer than 10 minutes, five minutes, two minutes. Two minutes is long. But he read the Bible on his knees that year. And then when New Year's Day came, we used to have this thing in the Methodist Church called Watch Night. I don't know if y'all ever heard of that, but John Wesley did, did this a long time ago. They would just, they would sit up at night on the night before New Year's and wait till the new year came and sing it in with hymns and prayer and dedication. And so he was practicing that by himself. And he said he was out in the woods on New Year's Day under some trees. He said he got down on the ground and he put his hands under his feet and over his head. And he said, I dedicated everything in between to Almighty God. Friends, I think that's what's meant when Jesus said, give to God what is God's. I think he meant for us to give our entire life to him. Everything belongs to God. Everything you see. Everything belongs to God, both you and me. As we live our lives, rendering unto Caesar isn't nearly as important as rendering unto God. Now, there's fine print to this sermon. There's an asterisk right there, and at the bottom of the page, I've got to add these words in fine print. My, my wife works for H&R Block, and is an enrolled agent, and she says, pay your taxes, okay? But it's more important. It's more important to render unto God the things that are God's, because when we do that, we become in right relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to close this sermon with a story. The first church that I worked at as a pastor was in the mountains of southwest Virginia. I had a two-point charge 
and I was single when I got there. I met Tammy a little bit later and married her while I was there, but uh, I found out when I got there that there was a job that the pastor of the Belfast Midway Circuit had that was not written down anywhere, but they informed me that my job on Sunday morning was to leave the house early enough to drive up a little mountain road to Mary's house. I didn't know who Mary was, but they told me what house it was, and I said, okay, I'll be there at such and such time, and they said, well, we'll tell her that you're coming. And so on Sunday morning, I went to Mary's house to go get her. And Mary's house was on an old mountain farm. She lived in a two-story farmhouse that was out in a place where you couldn't see any of the houses anywhere around it. But if you looked behind it, you saw the beautiful Clinch Mountain. And it was in the midst of a farm that was very hilly. And there was cattle and there were sheep on that farm. And there was a fence around her house and a gate going from the driveway into the back door. And I got there and Mary was not out yet. So I went to go see her at her kitchen. And uh, she answered the door with her walker. And she said, hello and I said Mary I'm the new preacher and she's lit up the wrinkles of her old face uh, looking relieved to see someone she was expecting and she asked me to come inside I was nervous it's my first Sunday I wanted to get to the church but I thought maybe I need to come inside because Mary said so so I went inside and sat down for a minute in her kitchen, a kitchen that was heated by an old wood stove, and she had a very worn Bible on the kitchen table that she was going to take to church with her that day. And she sat down and she opened it up. She said, I want to show you something. Mary had written in her Bible dates, put a big check mark by these dates. I looked at it and looked back at her and she said, these are the dates that I finished reading the Bible through from cover to cover. I said, Mary, that's fantastic. There were at least seven different dates on that. Mary, who could barely get around, got into my car that day, and we headed to church. And every day that I was pastor at the Midway United Methodist Church, every Sunday I took Mary to church. Even the Sunday that she was out in the yard laying on the ground when I got there where she had fallen. When I got her up, we headed back to the kitchen for a few moments to make sure she was okay. Even with blood that we cleaned up, Mary said, I'm going to church. And so we got in the car, and we headed to church. After I was married, <laughs> I had to tell my wife, on the way to Midway Church, I said, you have to sit in the back. <laughs> and she said, why is that? I said, because we're going to go pick up Mary. I let her sit in the front to Mary's house. But she quickly got out and helped with the gate and helped with the walker. And Mary and she would argue every Sunday about whether she was to sit in the back or the front. And Tammy would always say, you sit in the front. It was harder to get in the back. And we took Mary to church every day.
telling you about Mary to tell you about someone who, even though it was difficult for her to get out, even though she lived alone, even though she didn't have the ability to drive, even though she fell in the yard on a Sunday morning, when it was about 30 degrees, I don't know how long she had laid there before I got there. All she wanted to do was go to church. Because there was something about this God she read about in the scripture that made her want to give her life to him every day. last time I saw Mary alive was in the nursing home she was bent over kind of in a stupor her hands in her lap oh I wish you could have seen Mary's hands so bent with age and so wrinkled I looked at her for a moment before I said anything and I, I wondered if I should speak to her because she seemed to be in a nap. But something said, go ahead. So I said, Mary. And she looked up. She recognized who I was. And she smiled. And we talked about the Lord. And when we buried Mary, I knew in my heart where she had already gone. Because everything belongs to God. Everything you see, everything belongs to God. Both you and me. Today, we need to render unto God what is God's. If you've not done that yet, it's a simple decision that you can do in an altar of prayer, even in your seat, just to say to God, I want you to have my life. I want you to have my all. I give it to you. Use it for your glory. then I want you to watch what God does in your life. Will you pray with me? God, we hear the call to give our lives to you. Use us. Use all of us. A hundred percent. in your kingdom because everything belongs to you these things we ask in Jesus name Amen
There's so much that we can do for the Lord when we give our all to Him. This world will be a different place when God's people give their all to Him. If you believe that the world can be a better place, make it happen. As you give your hearts and lives to Him in service, everything belongs to Him. To go forth from this place, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's children everywhere said, Amen. Amen.